Chapter 1. Rags When my father was in his early twenties, he traveled by ship from China to Thailand, seeking a better life. He didn't bring many possessions with him, only some extra clothes that he stuffed in a Chinese traveling case. A woven bamboo shoulder pack. When he finally made his way to Thailand, he settled in the province of Chantaburi, where he lived in Klong Nam Kem district in the coastal town of Lam Singh on the Gulf of Thailand. That's where he met my mother, who was born in Chantaburi province to a Chinese father and a Thai mother. After they married, they moved ten miles north along the main Chantaburi Canal to live at Nong Bua village. My whole family, including my parents and grandparents, had a strong faith in Buddhism. After all, we were all born Buddhists. My father adopted the Thai name Sunchai Potikit. My mother's name was Fei Potikit. My parents made their living as merchants, operating a general store from the ground floor of our home, selling local produce such as fruit, rice, and fish. In those days, there were no motor cars, so people traveled from one place to another on foot. My dad used to walk the length and breadth of Chantaburi province, collecting the rent from his rice fields. His trekking covered long distances, three miles from Nongbua to Prao, six miles from Prao to Dongqing, and another six miles to Shrijomtian. He walked the whole route and then returned home straight after finishing his business. My dad was a strong and diligent man who worked very hard to build our family business. As for me, I was born on June 6, 1916, at Klong Nam Kem, Lam Sing District, Chantaburi Province. This date was equivalent to Tuesday, the sixth day of the seventh lunar month in the year of the fire dragon. I was the fourth child of a loving family with two older sisters, one older brother, two younger sisters, and one younger brother. My parents adopted our eldest sister, Pim, who was adored by all of us. Initially, my parents called me Aogia, which means black stone, because I have a large black birthmark on my back. Later, they shortened my name to Jia, which means eat in Chinese. Maybe I used to eat too much. The black birthmark, which stretches from the center of my back across my shoulder blade and down toward my waist, was said to be a very auspicious sign. I wasn't aware of that when I was growing up, but after I became a monk, I met a man in the south of the country who told me that it was very rare for anyone to be born with a black birthmark of such size on his back. It is claimed that people who have this type of birthmark tend to be as solid as a rock. They can endure anything. Whether it's extreme heat or extreme cold, ecstasy or misery, they can cope with every situation and overcome every obstacle. This makes for a good Dhamma teaching, reminding us to be emotionally firm, strong, and stable as a rock. When somebody pours filth on it, the rock is unmoved. Should someone pour perfume on it, it's equally unmoved. There is no reaction from the rock. My childhood home was a two-story shop house located at number 82, Unit 7, in the Muang district in Nongbua, near where the main canal empties into the sea. The house stood on the canal side of the road with its back to the water. The front of the house faced a hard, earthen street, crowded with many homes and small businesses. The rear of the house backed right up to the main canal which flowed down to the sea. A small area on the side between the house and the water, hugging the canal's edge and cordoned off by a fence made of driftwood slats, contained a dozen enormous round earthenware jars used for storing fresh rainwater. On the other side, a narrow bamboo walkway along the back of the house provided access to the landing pier where our boats were docked. Where the pier jutted out into the slow current, the tall wooden post that anchored it stood out distinctly against the rows of neatly moored boats that lined the canal. Tidewater filled the canal at high tide each day, raising the boats to the level of the pier as water flooded the wide basin in all directions. The long island that formed the opposite shore of the canal was sparsely populated. Only a few dwellings were visible from my house— for the most part, mango and lychee orchards grew all the way to the water's edge. Our house was built to last. 
supported from below by solid wooden posts and crossbeams, and clad with hardwood planks. It was built to withstand the extreme tropical weather conditions. The double teakwood sliding doors on the ground level opened to a long, spacious room with a wooden floor where my parents ran the general store, buying and selling various local commodities. An old glass cabinet and two green antique jars in the corner held items of special value. A wide staircase led to the upper floor that served as our family's living and sleeping quarters. Teak paneling covered the walls of all the upstairs bedrooms. Two doors opened onto a covered balcony overlooking the street. Wooden shingles covered the peaked roof, which was strong enough to withstand the punishing monsoon rains. When I was a boy, I felt a real aversion to the fermented shrimp paste we call cuppy, which has a pungent, rotten smell. When my big brother didn't want me to follow him around, he yelled at me over his shoulder, Hey, Gia, don't follow me. If you do, I'll throw shrimp paste on your head. That's all it took for me to scream out and run back home. When it came to food, I was always very hard to please. When the food contained a lot of pork fat, I'd throw a tantrum and stubbornly refuse to eat it. I was very fussy about what I ate and even kicked the food away angrily if it didn't please me. I was able to get away with that because my family was quite wealthy. Even today I refuse to eat shrimp paste, in part because it's made from shrimp heads, which I'm allergic to. I felt a piercing rectal pain every time I ate them, so I stopped taking them altogether. I'm allergic to many other kinds of food as well, which made it extremely difficult for me later when I was a monk living in the jungle with my teacher, Ajahn Mon Buridato. After finishing fourth grade at the local elementary school, I began working in the family business. Waking up early every morning, I pushed open the big double doors downstairs, cleaned and swept out the store, and stacked the merchandise at the front, ready for my mother to sell. I then ate and ran off to play with my friends until the afternoon. Each evening I lugged the unsold merchandise back inside, swept the floor again, and closed and locked the big doors. As I grew older, I was the one that did most of the heavy work, whether selling to customers at home or hauling goods to sell at the river market. Mostly we sold local fruit produce. Farmers delivered the fruits to our house where I packed them in woven bamboo baskets. My parents sold what they could at our home store, and I sold the excess at the local river market. In those days, the road system around our village was not well developed, so it was much easier to travel by boat to sell our goods. I loaded the baskets in one of our boats, which were moored out back, and took the produce to the local market. When fishing season came around, I focused my efforts on fishing. Because my house was located on the bank of a canal that connected to the sea, I became one of the best swimmers in the village. At high tide, water covered the entire landscape as far as the eye could see. Since I was out on the water in my boat fishing every day, I became very familiar with the sea currents. So how could I fail to be a good swimmer? One day, I noticed something bobbing on the surface of the canal about 600 feet from the bank. I thought it must be a rooster because I spied a patch of red on its head. I decided to fetch the rooster, so without delay I dove into the water and started swimming out into the current. As my steady strokes pulled me farther and farther from the shoreline, my friends became so worried I might drown that they began screaming, Look, Gia's going to drown! Gia's going to die! But how could I die? I was too good a swimmer for that. Water skills were second nature to me since I rode a boat every day to fish or deliver rice to the mill. Besides, the tide was going out, so I simply glided along with the prevailing current. Before long, I reached the rooster, only to discover that it was actually a vulture eating the bloated remains of a dog carcass floating on the surface. Startled, the vulture suddenly rose from the water and flew away. So much for my beautiful rooster. I couldn't stop laughing at my own foolishness as I looked back and saw myself impetuously leaping into the water and swimming as fast as I could to grab it. It was just the antics of a crazy kid, that's all. 
As a young man, I worked as a trader, selling fruits like rambutans, durians, and mangosteens. I tended to act the tough guy, serious, gruff, and afraid of no one. Like my father, I took my work seriously. Our forefathers were straightforward, honest people. They brooked no sympathy for the lies and deceit of others. This character trait was passed on from generation to generation until it reached me. I'm a very determined person. When I decide to achieve something, I won't stop striving until I succeed. For instance, at the landing where I took my boat to sell fruit, the riverbank rose steeply from the water's edge. None of the other merchants could manage to haul their boats up onto the bank. But I never failed to do so. I wouldn't stop pulling until I made it. I was really strong, and I didn't shy away from hard work. I just kept at it the whole time. I took the attitude that I would rather break than bend. That attitude led to a wild spirit that never allowed anyone to get the better of me. By that time, I owned two sailboats, one big and one small, and I used the big one for trading. Once a year, I delivered large containers of preserved durian fruit to Bangkok and Malaysia. I bought durian preserves from local villagers at 10 baht a pound and sold the stuff later for 28 baht a pound. It was hard to store so much of it in the house because it easily became moldy. I had to pack the containers carefully, compressing the jellied fruit until it was free of air bubbles, then covering the top with wax paper to seal it. If mold appeared, I cut the moldy parts off and repacked the good parts tightly in another container. Mine was one of the wealthiest families in the village. Because my father was a Chinese immigrant, we had only my mother's land to farm. So, after the durian season, we sold the rice that the local farmers produced. We bought raw, unhusked rice grown in the surrounding countryside and took it to a large rice mill for husking then sold it to customers for cooking. This was one of the ways that my family made a living each year. After the fruit season ended, I had to help with husking at the rice mill. We loaned milled rice to poor people who had no money to buy rice, and after the harvest, they gave us unhusked patty rice in return. Besides selling various goods on credit, my parents also loaned money. Many of the local farmers borrowed money from them. Most of those transactions were in the form of a verbal agreement. My parents simply depended on people's honesty. Occasionally, debtors denied ever borrowing the money. In those cases, my mother took the offenders to court, and invariably they lost. They were usually forced to give us a water buffalo to pay off the debt. One spiteful person fed the buffalo broken glass mixed with alcohol and grass before handing it over. The broken glass cut the animal's stomach so badly that it died a few weeks after we received it. In the end, we were cheated. We got nothing of value in return for our loan. Still, my mother never complained much. She was a very kind and generous person. My parents owned a lot of gold in the form of jewelry and ornaments, which had been fashioned into various shapes, such as turtles or birds. These gold ornaments were kept in bamboo baskets in our home, and my mother would return all the gold that people pawned with us as soon as they came to pay back their loan. My mother never cheated anyone. People in the surrounding area who were short of cash also borrowed money from my mother. Because they often paid off their debts at harvest time with sacks of rice, our store often had rice stacked to the ceiling. In those days, people liked wearing necklaces, bracelets, and anklets. We had dozens of bamboo baskets full of such gold jewelry. When the price of gold increased, people came to ask for their jewelry back. My mother returned it all to them at the original price. She said that she would not take from others, as it was unwholesome behavior. My mother was very benevolent. She had two older brothers who ordained as monks— named Venerable Lung Hui and Venerable Lung Hawk, who taught her the value of virtuous behavior. When she went to the monastery, they told her, Fay, don't cheat people when trading. The stuff you earn from cheating you cannot take with you when you die. Instead, 
it will lead you to birth in a hell realm. My mother always kept this admonition in mind. She also enjoyed making merit by offering donations to the local monastery. As I was still young at that time, I was not interested in merit-making. I would go to the monastery only when someone asked me to accompany them. I sometimes accompanied my grandmother to the local monastery when she went to make offerings to the monks on Buddhist festival days, such as Wisaka Puja or Maka Puja, or the beginning of the monastic rainy season retreat. We also set up a stall, providing free food to people who came to join the festivities. On those occasions, I stayed overnight at the monastery, helping to transport the rice that we used to cook rice porridge. By the time I turned 15 years old, I'd become the main strength of the family. My only interest was working hard and making lots of money for my parents. My mom and dad ran the shop, and I'd help them open it in the morning, and then spend the rest of the day on my sailboat buying and selling goods for them. I worked hard for our family's trading business, and I enjoyed the work, feeling a sense of pride and purpose every day as I set out on my own. I had a muscular body for a kid my age. Hoisting one on each shoulder, I regularly carried two 45-pound containers of durian preserves without any difficulty. I did not drink or take drugs. My only vice was smoking cigarettes. When I had free time during the fishing season, I would accompany three or four of my friends to lay fishing nets in the open sea. My big sailboat was used to haul the nets and bring the fish back. When the wind picked up, we caught so many anchovies they almost filled the boat. Back on shore, we sold them for the going rate, and I usually gave all the money to my friends. We were very close and traveled together everywhere, working hard and looking for a good time. Those childhood friends are all dead now. I remember going out with my friends during the New Year holiday season, playing poker, competing in Chinese board games, and shooting pool. Sometimes we fought among ourselves, sometimes we played happily together. That's just the way kids are. We never thought about the moral repercussions of our actions. In my youthful exuberance, I paid no attention to skillful actions and unskillful actions. I didn't bother much about good and evil, right and wrong. My only concerns were enjoying myself and making a living. I couldn't even recite basic Buddhist chants like Namo Tasa Bhagavato. If I happened to visit a monastery and hear a monk talk about the six sense bases, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, I couldn't make any sense out of what he was saying. I remember thinking to myself, what is this monk talking about? I didn't have a clue. Only later in life, when I became a monk myself, did I realize how important the six senses are in the Buddha's teachings. As I mentioned earlier, I refused to let anyone take advantage of me. On one occasion, when I went to the Riverside Market Landing to sell a boatload of fruit baskets at the pier, I punched a big Chinaman so hard that he passed out cold. My fist was that lethal. There was no way he could get back up by the count of ten. He couldn't even move. It all started when I was emptying my boat, placing the baskets of fruit on the pier, and this guy pulls up beside me in his boat and starts stacking his fruit baskets on top of mine. His baskets were much bigger and heavier than mine, but he just kept crushing my baskets with his. I shouted out that if he didn't stop, I'd punch him. But the big ape just ignored me and kept flattening my fruit. As soon as he dropped the next basket, that was it. Wham! I leveled him with an uppercut to the chin. And that settled it. I was ready to go at him again when the police suddenly arrived. The officer in charge was furious because this Chinese guy was a subordinate of his. At the time, I felt that I was in the right because he barged right in like a thug. He ignored the rules. The rule at the landing was first come, first served. The boat that arrived first was allowed to unload its cargo onto the pier first. Latecomers had to keep their goods in the hold until the first boat finished unloading and received payment, and the pier was cleared for the next one. On top of that, if the brute damaged my fruit, I'd get paid less and lose a lot of money. So I had to fight. As it turned out, the Chinaman's boss was one of my mother's friends. 
Later, my mother scolded me for being so heavy-handed. I immediately shouted back at her, Why? Why do you believe those people? If it's going to be like that, I won't work anymore. I'm finished. Are you going to let them bully us? That guy damaged our fruit. What do you say about that? Each basket is worth a lot of money, Mom. In the end, my mom had to relent because my reasoning was good. That guy started the whole thing by trying to push me around. I wasn't all that unruly as a kid, but I was really stubborn. Everyone was wary of me, and I'd be damned if I was going to let anyone push me around. Sometime later, I was rowing my boat into the same docking area when I ran into three or four other guys who were struggling to control their boats. So I just pulled around them and got to the pier first. When they accused me of cheating, I grabbed a big oar and stared them down, daring them to come get me. I really meant business. They were clumsy handling their boats. Why should I have to wait? I wasn't going to mess around. If they had made a move that day... I'd have broken some bones for sure. I would probably have killed someone, which would have been disastrous. I would never have been able to ordain. Instead, I'd have been running from the cops. Fortunately, those guys didn't dare approach me. Because I had finished the fourth grade of elementary school, my teacher tried to persuade me to become a teacher like him. He offered a salary of three baht per month. I didn't take up his offer. My mother also wanted me to be a teacher, so she tried to encourage me. I said, no way. Right now I can earn a lot more than that just by hauling durian fruit to the market. Why should I be a teacher? No way. And besides, I was not that good at my studies, just average. My mother kept pestering me to be a teacher because she felt it was an honorable profession. So when I was 15 years old, I went to help teach at the school for about 10 days. The students were so damn stubborn that I soon became annoyed and fed up with them. They didn't listen or pay attention to my lessons. They were awfully difficult to please. I thought long and hard about how to keep them under control. In the end, I hit on the idea of using an extremely bitter medicinal vine called Borapet. It was well known that when a mother wanted to stop breastfeeding her baby, she would rub Borapet on her breasts. When sucking her nipples, the baby tasted only the bitterness of the vine. Over time, the baby was weaned from breast milk until it showed no further interest in suckling. Taking that as my inspiration, I carried a handful of Borapet with me to school and placed slivers of it in the mouths of the naughty students. That was enough to cure their misbehavior. Following that, the kids were very well behaved. However, when they returned home, they still had the bitter taste of Borapet in their mouths, so they complained to their parents. Then all hell broke loose. Their mothers came to lodge a formal protest at the school, which became a big story all over the district. I couldn't figure out what all the fuss was about. How on earth could anyone be harmed by tasting Borapet? Anyway, I couldn't help it. Those students were too much. I told their parents as much, but they were in no mood to listen. So I resigned from my position. When I was young, I liked trading, and I was always restless. I couldn't stay still. Human beings can't remain idle. They must work for a living. Most of my jobs were related to the sea, and because I was strong and smart on the water, I hardly ever felt afraid when traveling that way. I used to sail my boat from Chantaburi to buy coffin planks on Elephant Island, which was in the Gulf of Thailand off the coast of the neighboring province. I regularly traveled there to buy the planks, then sold them later back on the mainland for a good profit. If planks weren't available, I purchased shrimp paste or pumpkins instead. Some years it was quite pleasant going to the island as I could work and have fun at the same time. The weather was good, the beach was beautiful, and good cheap food was easy to find. Elephant Island was a big land mass surrounded by about 28 smaller islands of various sizes. The island was carpeted with the thick vegetation of tropical rainforests and boasted several high mountain ranges, 
which were the source of the numerous waterfalls and short canals that crisscrossed its interior. It rained there almost year-round. The heaviest rains blew in from the sea during the rainy season months between May and October. From November to January, the wind blew from the shore out to sea. The villagers called it the North Wind, which gusted strongly for three to seven days, then slowed down for a week or two before increasing again. From February to April, the wind blew toward the shore again, but its breezes were slow and soft. I preferred sailing to the island during that period, as it was the safest time to be out at sea. Apart from those months, trading boats faced the danger of capsizing in the high winds and large waves of a seasonal typhoon. Villagers on the island subsisted on gardening and fishing, and by selling their goods to visiting tradesmen. Besides buying coffin planks, I also loaded my boat with shrimp paste, pumpkins, second-grade fish sauce, sun-dried fish and shrimp, as well as salted fish, each of which was very cheap. Big pumpkins cost only one or two cents. I really enjoyed trading because, with only a small amount of money, I could buy lots of produce to fill up my boat. Sometimes my mother complained to me, Gia, what did you buy this for? And I would reply, It's so cheap, Mom. Why should I waste my time going there and then come back with an empty boat? On one occasion, my parents asked me to go buy coffin planks on Elephant Island. No sooner had I set sail than a violent squall suddenly whipped my boat around and rammed it bow-first into the nearest bank. The waves were so high and the wind so strong that the boat nearly broke apart. Before I left on that trip, my grandmother taught me to meditate by continuously repeating the words Budang, Damang, Sankang as a meditation focus. She said that the power of the triple gem would protect me. She told me, We Buddhists must cultivate the virtues of the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha in our minds. And then we will avert all dangers. When the storm arose with its huge waves crashing all around me, tossing my boat up and smashing it into the shore, and the howling, shrieking sound of the wind battering my ears, I thought I might die then and there. Suddenly, I recalled the meditation mantra that my grandmother taught me. So I started to repeat, Budang, Damang, Sankang. Once my mind became focused on the words, my fear of death subsided. Not long after that, amazingly, the gale force winds also subsided, and I was able to maneuver the boat to calmer waters. Shortly after I turned 20, my outlook on life started to change. I had a steady relationship with a girl named Pang, and we were planning to get married. Before taking that step, I wanted to ordain as a monk, as a way of paying back all the kind-hearted things that my parents had done for me. I knew they would be pleased with my decision, especially since I intended to remain a monk for only three months. Besides that, I was becoming increasingly frustrated with the way my eldest sister was handling the family finances. I wanted a break from work, as I did most of the labor, but received few of the profits. Nobody tried to persuade me to become a monk. It simply occurred to me that at age twenty the time was right to ordain as a way of repaying all the people in my life who had been so kind and supportive. At that time, two senior disciples of Ajahn Mon Buridato, Ajahn Li Damadaro and Ajahn Gongma Chirapunyo, were wandering Dutanga in Chantaburi province, teaching people the benefits of giving up immoral behavior and cultivating moral virtue in their lives. Prior to their arrival, forest monks had never visited the eastern part of Thailand. They were the first teachers to introduce the Thai forest meditation tradition to residents on the East Coast. Ajahn Gongma settled for a while at a local monastery near Nong Bua, where my grandmother sometimes took me to offer alms food. I was impressed by his resolute demeanor. Dhamma, the teachings of the Buddha, is the most precious treasure in the world. Nothing else in the world compares to it. Why do I say this? Just look at me. I was always stubborn and full of mischief. 
Even though my parents were wealthy and respected members of the community, I had no interest in Dhamma when I was growing up. I just wanted to enjoy myself, playing around like the other boys my age. Still, I must have accumulated a reservoir of merit in my previous lives. That store of merit, combined with my parents' unshakable faith in the efficacy of Kama, eventually pulled me in the direction of the Buddha's teachings. A human birth is a fortunate one. Each of us who is born a human being can trace our good fortune back to the merit we accumulated from good and skillful actions performed in our past lives. Some people are born with severe handicaps, such as blindness, deafness, muteness, or mental illness. All possible results of doing unskillful acts of body, speech, and mind in previous lives. Those who experience the results of their former skillful actions are born with good physical and mental faculties and bright and clear minds. In addition to that, some are born into wealthy families where life is especially easy because they needn't work hard to earn a living. This level of well-being is known as Pube Kata Punyata, which means abundant merit accumulated from past actions. Those who enjoy the benefits of ample merit should use that resource wisely to strive for higher and higher forms of merit. Unfortunately, most people don't have occasion to listen to Dhamma teachings from a meditation master. Instead, they gravitate toward worldly pursuits. Newborns' first teachers are their parents, who, because they themselves are more familiar with and more skilled in worldly affairs, tend to teach their children mundane knowledge instead of knowledge based on principles of Dhamma. Normally, parents prefer their children to marry, make a decent living, and raise families of their own to continue the family line, which from the viewpoint of the real aim of the Buddha's teachings, putting an end to the causes of suffering, is equivalent to saddling their children with a lifetime of pain and dissatisfaction. Unfortunately, most parents show little interest in reflecting deeply on the implications the Buddha's teachings have for their lives and the future happiness of their children. Instead, they encourage their children to cope with life in the same way they have, which often means enduring the same feelings of struggle, dissatisfaction, and anxiety they themselves experience. The Buddha possessed the supreme vision to see and know all aspects of human experience, and all of them showed themselves to be on fire. That's why the Buddha declared emphatically that everything is on fire. By everything, he meant every facet of all six human sense faculties. The five external senses plus the mind. It includes their respective organs and objects, their operation, and all the feelings produced by their operation. The Buddha clearly stated that all the factors that make up human experience are ablaze with the fires of greed, aversion, and delusion. The five aggregates are the five components of a living being, which means they are the five components of all experience. What we normally think of as a person or living being is, in fact, a set of five processes. The first of these, form, is comprised of the five physical senses. The remaining four processes are feelings of pain or pleasure, memory or recognition, thought or imagination, and consciousness, which can take any of the other aggregates as its object. The Buddha saw these groups to be blazing masses of fuel. Consciousness and its objects are like fires consuming fuel in that they consist of an unceasing series of dynamic changes. The Buddha compared the five aggregates that constitute life's experiences to heaps of burning firewood that add fuel to the flames of craving, aversion, and delusion, and stoke the fires of suffering that they cause. Extinguishing those fires led the Lord Buddha to the supreme bliss of Nibbana. The Buddha was born the crown prince of a royal kingdom. Growing up, he exhibited exceptional intelligence, along with a compassionate heart and a bright mind that easily mastered any skill in any field of activity he attempted. Even his physical feats demonstrated supernatural powers. Legend has it that, without prior training, he strung the most powerful bow in the ancient world and drew the taut string back so hard that the arrow hit the center of a target 1,000 feet away thus displaying his unrivaled ability to harness the forces of the natural world. 
He was in fact so gifted that he could accomplish any feat he set his mind to. But having spent eons of his past lifetimes developing supreme virtues, he was destined from birth to attain Sama Sambodhinyana, the spiritual wisdom of the awakened ones, to help others achieve transcendent happiness through the knowledge and practice of Dhamma. The young prince Siddhartha was taught by his father to accept the idea that living a life of luxury and comfort was the way to experience happiness. For decades, he enjoyed a life of pleasure and privilege residing at the royal court. When he eventually encountered a decrepit old man, a severely ill man, and a corpse being carried to the funeral pyre by mourners, he realized that all human beings without exception are destined to get sick, grow old, and die. This insight caused him great dismay. He became so disenchanted with the worldly pleasures he'd enjoyed that he resolved to leave his home and take up the life of a wandering ascetic. The Buddha-to-be then began a six-year quest for enlightenment by first practicing a regimen of extreme austerities in an attempt to burn off the mental impurities that bound him to the world of life and death. After much trial and error and a change of strategy, he finally awakened to Sama Sambodhi Jnana, attaining the supreme wisdom of all Buddhas. Following enlightenment, the Buddha began a life of teaching others that lasted for forty-five years. He soon gathered around him other ascetics who had renounced worldly life, and he initiated them into the Bhikkhu Sangha. The conduct of this order of monks was governed by the Vinaya rules of monastic discipline, rules that have guided the conduct of Buddhist monks right up to the present day. Its emphasis on learning, practice, and discipline makes the Bhikkhu Sangha an extraordinary brotherhood. It is in essence a royal lineage, for we monks are the sons of a Buddha. With that in mind, I regard the common Thai practice of short-term ordination to be disrespectful to the Buddha's original intentions. It is now customary for Thai men to become monks with the intention of remaining in the Sangha for only a few months, sometimes only a few days, before abandoning that privilege to return to lay life. Their reason for ordaining has nothing to do with renouncing worldly pleasures and escaping from the prison of Sangsara, which has always been the proper purpose for joining the Buddha's Bhikkhu Sangha. Alas, my own path to monkhood followed a similar pattern. Out of respect for my parents, I had decided to ordain when I reached the age of twenty. But just after I turned twenty, my plans were delayed when I was unexpectedly conscripted into military service. After undergoing an initial period of basic training at the local center, I was released from my military obligations because the army intended to recruit only forty new soldiers that year. Since enough men had volunteered to cover that quota, I was not required to move forward with military training. I felt relieved that I didn't have to be a soldier. But even after my stint in the army ended, I still found excuses to delay my ordination. Another season passed before I got around to it. When I finally made up my mind to proceed, it was with the intent that after being in robes for a reasonable amount of time, I would give up the monkhood and marry the girl I loved. Initially, family and friends were surprised I was willing to join the monkhood, considering I had never in my life chanted the basic Namo Tassa verses, and that my unruly temperament was at odds with the Buddhist ideal of self-restraint and strict discipline. I'd never looked down on the monks or their lifestyle, but my only concern as a young man was to have fun and enjoy my life like everyone else my age. Everybody called me a troublemaker, which was fair enough, but I wasn't a hooligan. At the same time, I wasn't afraid of anyone either, even the hooligans, I was prepared to lose any amount in an honest card game, but I could never tolerate cheating. I convinced my friend, Ott, to ordain together with me. His parents and mine took us to meet with a John Gong Ma at the local monastery and asked him to prepare us for ordination. When people heard the news, they said, Gia, he'll never ordain. Even if he manages to put on the robes, he'll never make it through. He will definitely disrobe within the first few months. Now his friend ought, he's so well behaved. 
He'll probably remain a lifetime in the monkhood. In actual fact, Ott disrobed a few days after the ordination ceremony, and I'm still here. People are like that. They mostly focus on outward appearances. Then again, they did have a point. Who would have guessed that I could succeed as a monk? I was so stubborn and as restless as a monkey. I was the village troublemaker. I was obviously unprepared for monastic living. When I finally walked through the gates at Saingam Forest Monastery to request ordination, I lacked even a basic understanding of the Buddha, his life, and his teachings. I felt like a log of green wood with all its branches and leaves still intact being shoved into a firebox. That is how I entered the monkhood, unsuitable and awkward in every way. In truth, my girlfriend was the center of my attention. Because of her, I planned to be a monk for only a few months, and then disrobe. Before ordaining, I promised her that the situation would just be temporary, that I'd remain a monk for only four months as a gift of merit to share with my parents, and that I'd marry her after leaving the robes. Many young men who take temporary ordination are simply biding their time in the sangha until they are free to disrobe and pursue their interest in women, the main attraction when we're young. This was also my mindset in those days. I was just a young kid, out to have a good time. I didn't know anything about Dhamma. I didn't understand the difference between skillful and unskillful behavior. Back then, I couldn't have cared less about the consequences of my actions. During the weeks of training before I shaved my head and put on the garb of a white-robed postulant, I continued to misbehave. When I was alone and nobody was watching, I'd sneak out of the monastery and go home for a while. But once I'd shaved my head and put on the white robes, I made a resolve to never sneak back home again. Only later, after I ordained and spent time learning from my teacher, Ajahn Gong Ma, did I realize how heedless I'd been. Ajahn Gong Ma constantly reprimanded me. Always consider your actions carefully. Reflect on your purpose before you act. Don't act hastily when you should take your time. Don't act slowly when you need to be quick. If you don't give sufficient thought to making the right choices, bumbling your way through life like a clumsy idiot, you'll tend to meet with only pain and suffering. At Saingam Forest Monastery's resident teacher, Ajahn Gong Ma was appointed to tutor me in preparation for my ordination. Making myself ready for ordination entailed being dressed in white, training in moral discipline by strictly following the rules of good conduct and other monastic regulations, and being well informed about all the duties I should do for the monastery and my master. These were strict requirements. Only when Ajahn Gong Ma saw that a postulant was competent in these tasks would he ordain him. If a postulant was unable to carry them out to his satisfaction, he held off the ordination until he saw improvement. Ajahn Gong Ma took very seriously the traditional practices championed by Dutanga forest monks. He was never indulgent toward an ordination candidate's careless disregard for his strict training methods. He made sure each candidate was properly trained before becoming a monk. I, too, received the same treatment. For months, I lived with Ajahn Gongma as a white-robed postulant who was required to accompany him and attend to his daily needs. Throughout those months of initial training, I worked hard to learn each step of the ordination procedure and struggled to memorize the ordination chanting, focusing on how to properly pronounce the complex sounds of the Pali language. The long and short vowels, the nasal sounds the variance in the consonants, and the proper cadence. Besides that, I practiced the correct method of bowing to the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, and to my teacher. Every morning and evening, I sat in on a John Gong Ma's Dhamma talks, learning how to meditate by acquainting myself with the meditation objects prescribed by the Buddha. On a night, not too long after I began my training, during the period I was rehearsing the chants for my ordination, I listened attentively to Ajahn Gong Ma deliver his regular evening Dhamma talk. 
He had taught us to mentally recite Budo while listening to his talks, which I did. Although I couldn't understand every word he spoke, I continued reciting the meditation word Budo until my mind became absorbed in it. While I meditated on Budo, my ears continued to acknowledge Ajahn Gong Ma's voice, but my mind remained focused on the meditation word. That is to say, my mind was doing its duty, and my ears were doing theirs. Suddenly and unexpectedly, my mind dropped into a still, calm, quiet samadhi state. The samadhi experience then gave rise to a strange occurrence. As my mind converged into one-pointedness, a mental image arose of me kneeling and then collapsing face down on the white sand that covered the monastery compound. The vision was clear and precise. It was unmistakably the white sand in the monastery. This unusual perception lasted until Ajahn Gong Ma finished speaking, at which time the mind returned to ordinary consciousness. When my normal awareness resumed, I humbly approached Ajahn Gong Ma on my knees and asked him, Venerable sir, a moment ago while I sat listening to your Dhamma talk, I felt that my body had disappeared. Is that possible? Where did my body go? These were the words I used, for I didn't know the right way to describe my experience. Before that vision occurred, I'd never felt brave enough to ask Ajahn Gong Ma a question. But... The excitement I felt that night emboldened me to speak out. Ajahn Gong Ma replied, You have nothing to worry about. Everything is okay. Your meditation is improving. Just keep working on it. I took pride in the knowledge that I was on the right track. I felt how fortunate it was that I'd found such a good teacher, someone who knew about meditation from his own practical experience rather than mere speculation or guesswork. Finding an excellent teacher is of critical importance in meditation. If your teacher has the wisdom of a sage, he can set you on the right path to discover the truth for yourself. Never before had I found the degree of tranquility I did that night. When it happened, my mind instantly thought, what could this be? And its immediate conclusion was, this is happiness. That experience was my real initiation into monastic life. The fact that my mind reached that stage of calm at the beginning of my training helped me to quickly develop higher levels of virtue and more profound levels of insight. Meditating in that monastic environment naturally inspired my mind to strive for increasingly higher levels of spiritual attainment, which is the true aim of monastic life. To achieve that objective, a monk must harness his powers of discipline and determination to ward off thoughts and emotions that can trouble his mind. For instance, before I ordained as a postulant, I was really deluded about women and their attractiveness. Even after ordination, thoughts of my girlfriend Pang and our relationship still tormented me at first. But being an earnest and determined individual... I found it easy to put the Buddha's teachings into practice. After my amazing samadhi experience, I saw my girlfriend in a different light. Previously, seeing her face every day on alms round caused a pang of longing to pierce my heart. But when I met her the day after my mind first dropped into that tranquil state of samadhi, I stopped on the road and told her that I had decided to remain in robes. I would not be returning home as I had promised. I wanted to tell her candidly that I wasn't stupid anymore, that I was through with being a slave to my desires. But I was concerned that stating my feelings so bluntly would hurt her feelings. Soon after that incident, I turned my attention to contemplating the human body as a topic of meditation. The Buddha highly recommended body contemplation practices that aimed at counteracting attachment to one's own body and at preventing one from perceiving the bodies of others as objects of desire. Because attraction to pang occasionally crept into my mind, I decided to begin practicing a subha meditation, which focuses attention on the unattractive and unpleasant aspects of the human body. Of all the body contemplation practices taught by the Buddha, 
Asuba is the most powerful and effective meditation for countering sexual craving. I began practicing Asuba meditation by probing deeply into the various parts that make up the physical body. In my meditation, I peeled away the body's thin coating of skin to reveal the bloody and repulsive mess underneath. While doing so, I was constantly struck by the human body's inherently disgusting nature. What I encountered resembled a living, stinking corpse more than a human being. The whole thing repulsed me. I couldn't stand the sight of it. That woman's body that I couldn't resist grabbing a few months before completely lost its appeal. Once I turned my full attention to the body's true nature and away from temptations of the flesh, my mind let go of lust and dropped into a clear, calm, concentrated state of samadhi. As for Pang, she later married a man from Khao Saming. They eventually moved to Sam Coke District and died there. It's sad, really. She lived and died without doing anything meaningful with her life. And to think, that was the woman I fell in love with. It just goes to show how important associating with virtuous people is in life. I try to tell people that, but it's usually a waste of time because most people fail to understand. Perhaps they have too much dust in their eyes to focus on the truth. The Lord Buddha put it best when he said, those who can scrub the muck of defilements from their minds and pull out the thorn of sexual craving from their hearts, such people will rid themselves of delusion. They will remain unperturbed in the face of praise or blame, happiness or suffering. After I put on the postulant's robes, listening to Ajahn Gongma's Dhamma talks encouraged me to reflect on the virtuous qualities of my parents and on the inevitable hardships of family life. I thought about how difficult it was for them to raise me, how much they sacrificed for my sake. I began to realize how much suffering is involved in raising a family and in what ways it can at times resemble a living hell. The more I contemplated it, the more I realized that most parents are so busy bringing up their children that they rarely have time to rest and take it easy. That thought reminded me of an old Thai story about the virtuous man with a loving family who was having a difficult time making ends meet. As he walked through the forest one day, he came across a lush mango tree that had dropped some of its fruit. He gathered up the most beautiful mangoes on the ground and saved them for his children to eat. He saved the overly ripe mangoes for his wife and the rotting ones he kept for himself. But he made sure to eat the spoiled fruit only when he was alone, as he didn't want his wife and kids to know about his sacrifices. This story calls attention to a certain reality about worldly life that those untrained in the principles of Dhamma don't fully understand. For instance, although my parents sacrificed so much time and energy to ensure that I experienced success and happiness in the world, they, like most parents, failed to realize that true happiness is not found in material gains or pleasurable pursuits. On the contrary, true happiness is found in the heart of someone who is unattached to worldly concerns. This is an essential principle of Dhamma, which exists within the heart of every individual. It is accessible to everyone who chooses to meditate on the Buddha's teachings. I myself had been content to follow my parents' lead in life. I always respected them as my teachers without questioning their motives. It wasn't until I began reading the Buddha's life story soon after my ordination that my views on the purpose of family life began to change. I was struck by the fact that the Buddha was born into a wealthy family where he lived the luxurious life of a prince. Seeking to foster happiness for his son, his father so thoroughly shielded the young prince from all forms of unpleasantness that he was completely unaware of the pain, suffering, and hardship of life in the world outside the palace. But when the prince finally managed to venture outside the palace walls, he was confronted with the reality common to all human beings when he saw an old man, a sick man, and a corpse. The inevitability of old age, sickness, and death caused him to question the direction of his life. Inspired by seeing the peaceful demeanor of a wandering ascetic, 
the future Buddha resolved to renounce his exalted status and all his possessions and leave the palace in search of the true source of happiness. The Buddha's story illustrates that even with the best intentions, parents can steer their children in a direction designed to perpetuate the cycle of life and death and the pain and suffering that comes with it, while instilling in them a false sense of security in their outlook on life. Most children grow up with parents who emphasize worldly concerns, such as how to make money and earn a living. They want their children to continue the family lineage and have kids of their own. Eventually, children learn to think in the same way their parents do. This outlook becomes an obstacle that discourages young people from taking a serious interest in Dhamma. Even though a human birth has given them the physical and mental capacity to grasp the basic teachings of the Buddha, they nonetheless end up spending most of their time thinking about worldly matters of little substance and fail to recognize and act on their heart's inherent spiritual qualities. This aspect of worldly existence is the reason why I say family life is difficult and burdensome. Everyone who is born on this planet wants to experience genuine happiness in their lives. At the same time, everyone who comes to birth is bound to have a mind controlled by the forces of greed, hatred, and delusion. Due to a lack of training in faithfully upholding the precepts and practicing meditation, these dark forces are bound to dominate in the never-ending pursuit of commonplace, mundane goals. All of us have parents who nurtured and protected us. Our very survival has depended on our parents more than anything else. If they had not taken care of us every step of the way, then we might not be alive today. Then again, because our parents brought us up with care— provided us with an education, and helped us to establish ourselves in a career and build our own family, we are conditioned to follow the way of life they taught us, without questioning it. The mission of most parents is the pursuit of wealth and worldly gains, and this mission becomes their descendants' inheritance when they die. They live full of hope that their children and grandchildren will follow their example— and carry on the struggle to achieve or exceed the same goals they hold dear. In the end, people feel obliged to please those loved ones who have spent so much time and effort looking after them. Rarely does a son or a daughter seize the chance to free themselves from the burdens of lay life. In everyday life, people try to live in a way that produces the kinds of causes which bring them good and beneficial results. It is natural for people to want to better their situation and be successful in life. But regardless of how hard they work to achieve success, at the time of death all their mundane achievements will be lost. Most people spend their lives chasing after worldly prosperity with the aim of amassing wealth for themselves and their family. Their basic goals in life are to have good health, a happy family life, a prosperous livelihood, and general satisfaction but they seldom think clearly about the limitations of those forms of happiness. In fact, the effort put forth to achieve prosperity and happiness fails to deliver lasting peace of mind, because people ignore the basic principle that all things that arise also pass away, that every accomplishment, by its very nature, is impermanent and therefore untrustworthy. Because they never last, worldly successes have only limited value. In the end, their effects will all disappear. To understand these limitations and overcome them, people must examine their minds in light of the Buddha's teachings on right view and right intention. And to achieve that, they must seek seclusion from the dust and confusion of everyday life and take up the practice of meditation in earnest. Unless people search for the causes of their suffering and make efforts to eliminate those causes, the pleasures of good health and wealth will be only short-term remedies for their suffering, and not a lasting solution. Without wisdom, people easily become concerned with the material rewards of their actions, or with their desire for praise and a good reputation in society, all of which will soon be gone.
The Buddha established a spiritual training whereby a person who practices meditation with right view and right intention can attain sublime states of calm and concentration that transcend the bounds of common worldly pleasures and their false promise of happiness. In truth, practicing meditation is a means of attaining the highest form of happiness. No measure of happiness exceeds the happiness made possible by engaging in the mental training that leads directly to Nibbana. Even a small amount of progress along the path in the direction of Nibbana is far more beneficial than the pleasures associated with good health and wealth, which only succeed in making life in Sangsara a little more comfortable. On the other hand, when done with the right commitment and determination, meditation practice without a doubt leads toward the realization of Nibbana, the ultimate happiness and the end of all suffering. Buddhists have the advantage that the Buddha clearly laid out the correct way to practice at every step of the path. Unfortunately, most people waste the excellent chance to make progress in the practice of Dhamma that a human birth provides. If they would only take advantage of the opportunity to come to the monastery to practice meditation and listen to Dhamma talks, they could learn to free their minds from the burden of troublesome thoughts and emotions. Like the Buddha and his Arahant disciples, they should seek out quiet and secluded locations that are removed from the disturbances of lay life. Such retreat environments are naturally conducive to practicing meditation for the sake of peace and tranquility.